content sharing is a significantly smaller portion of what's taking place on the web than the kind of conversation, right? That that when teachers go to conferences, that they're they're engaging with each other, they're having great conversations. I don't see them trading business cards to be able to send each other lesson plans. And I'm wondering how much of the lesson plan conversation is actually driven by organizations that have an interest in having that be the conversation Interesting. versus how much is it really taking place? How much do, do educators really go out searching for and be willing to pay for a lesson plan? Uh, that's a that's a really that is a really interesting point, and I I don't know. I mean, I would say that the some of the very popular sites, the Teachers Pay Teachers and the Better Lesson, certainly um, tout a lot of interest in the site. And the fact you know the fact now that the um, that the AFT American Federation of Teachers is in on the game seems seems to me that this is something that um, is um, is. Is they that they seem as useful, if not well utilized, um, and I don't know. I mean, I think that in some ways the lesson plans. I think lesson plans are shared. I'm just not sure that they are have been shared in the same way that we can easily share them now, thanks to thanks to the sort of digital version, right? So if I want to ask, I ask a colleague, "How did you teach? You know, how did you teach this particular unit?" Um, I'm not necessarily copying and paste, or I haven't up until, you know, the last few years been able to sort of copy and paste um, things the same way. I might borrow their worksheet. I might re redo their worksheet. Um, and that might have been something that was handled manually. Um, I do think now that the ease with which we can um, copy and share um, does mean that this is happening more often. I want to be proven wrong, or I'm yeah. willing to be proven wrong. And I'm I've not been a teacher, and I, you know, there's I have limited information here, but it has felt to me like the focus on lesson plans um, keeps the institution in a certain kind of a role. Mm -hmm. And all of my experience over the last five years with bringing teachers together in these communities is it's the social, right? And that means that the role of the institution is significantly diminished when the educators are connecting with each other and sh I mean sharing sort of however they want to share in whatever ways they want to share. So I'm just harboring a little bit of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Again, you or, or listeners can tell me that I'm way off base here. That that the focus on lesson plans is actually a little bit of a red herring because it serves the interest of organizational roles rather than what's actually taking place. No, we'll I leave yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I definitely think that that is probably true in some ways, but I, I don't know that that should sort of stop us from thinking about, again, this question of, yes. of ownership. Yeah. yeah who, owns the, who owns the content, right. especially, especially when there's long-term use by the network? And we face this with social networks and Facebook and others right. where they have to have verbiage in there that allows them to resurface the data to mm -hmm. make matches um, but also you know maybe the language not being clear in terms of um, who actually owns that content right you own it but not exclusively right <laughs> okay so tell me about hacking schooling I'm shedding a tear here uh oh <laughs> <laughs> I bought the domain name hacking k12 uh huh thinking of the exact same idea <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to do a, a parallel version to the Hacking Higher Ed book. But uh, you've beat me to the punch and good, more power to you. <laughs> so you and John Becker have announced this Hacking Schooling project. Tell us yes, about it. So this is, we are, we're stealing a page of the playbook from the Hacking Me Academy project, which, um, which was, oh gosh, I think it's been over a year since, um, I think Dan Cohen from George Mason University was one of the organizers. And it was a one week, one book project. They announced one week um, to that they would have a call for a call for papers open for a week. Anyone could submit their um, could be their essays, their blog posts, their articles, their videos, any sort of digital idea on what it meant to um, hack the academy. And so John and I are taking that same idea, but making it we're thinking more broadly about schooling. And now, arguably, this could be you know uh, K twelve, but we don't want to limit limit it just to 
um, just to K-12. We want to think about the ideas of school and schooling in general. Um, and thinking about what does it mean, you know, what does it mean in terms of hacking, you know, spaces, hacking content, hacking curriculum, assessment, professional development. Um, so we're looking for submissions through, I think, Tuesday is our week, our week deadline for this. You couldn't have chosen a worse week. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, all of the activity on all of my networks is down because people are on vacation. So, I mean, I shouldn't have said that in such a, in a, such a, a non-thoughtful way. It feels to me like it's a week in which a lot of people are offline or are doing other things. Are you getting a good enough response that you feel like you can produce what you want to produce? I think we've got um, John. Uh, I haven't seen all of the responses yet, but um, John says that we're, we've been we've received uh, quite a few. So hopefully we will. I mean, we thought about this as well. You know, the summer in some ways the summer is great to get things from um, from from K twelve teachers in particular, or, or anyone in, in academics who who works the nine month uh, schedule. But you're right. I mean, I think that the, that the trade off. We, we worried about waiting too much longer into August once people return from their vacations that the focus becomes back to school and it's still hard to sort of get, get the ball rolling then until, you know, late fall. So the, the whole idea of ha hack, so brilliantly brought forth by you and your blog, mm -hmm. um, also by uh, Dale Stevens. Um, and I, I, do we know if his book is out yet? Or it's not out close? yet. Yeah, not yet. Right. I mean, this is a very interesting thing, and I did a hack your PD, or, um, you know, I did a hack your education session at ISTE as a birds of a feather, and the intriguing thing for me there was the number of people who came who wanted to talk about hacking PD. Interesting. Hacking professional development. So I think there's some there's some really uh, and in, uh, there's something really interesting happening here, and in that session it became clear that both meanings of the word both hack as the core kind of get it done computer mm -hmm. philosophy mm -hmm. and hack as the subversive go around yes. philosophy both have meaning to people yes so i think it's a good word and i'm and delighted that you're doing it and and we'll look forward to seeing the the fruits of it yeah i'm excited for this project too so okay so you also you get a sneak preview of edu clipper I do, yes. And, and um, again, I have to make my standard disclaimer here that I'm doing consulting work for Gina Bianchini, whose product is probably a competitor called Mighty Bell. So you're, you, saw, you, you saw something we can't fully see yet from Adam Bello, but tell us about it and tell sort of about the trends here and what you like. Well, the, I think that, you know, I've, there are a number of, um, a number of folks who are working on similar ideas to what Adam has built here, which I think... Um, is in some ways like a, a Pinterest um, for education, a way for you to collect um, collect links, videos, photos, documents, and share them on a on a clipboard, on a virtual clipboard with either the public or with a, a smaller private group. Um, and I think it's a you know it is an idea that we saw from Grockett's new project Learnist. It's similar. It is somewhat similar to what Gene is doing with Mighty Bell. And I think it harkens back to in some ways some of the older um, link sharing sites like Delicious and Digo, even where you can bundle together resources and then share them in turn with turn with other people. I do like what Adams built here, partially because I think um, you can really see in some ways partially with his own experience um, as a person who's been collecting and sharing resources on his own site, EduTecker, for a number of years now. But I think he understands sort of the, the, some of the, not just the, tech, the, the mechanics behind what makes, um, what makes a good sharing, uh, curating and sharing tool, but also he's also really thinking about this in terms of what works for the school setting. And despite a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz about Pinterest and a lot of folks who are saying, talking about ways to use it in the classroom and use it in libraries, um, Pinterest really isn't, it isn't ideal. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's already um, one of those tools that unfortunately um, sort of overzealous schools will, 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 will block, um, will filter a block. Um, and so Adam's created something here that's really, really geared towards um, towards usage. 
So there, in my conversations on this topic, sort of two of the areas in which I've, I've been sort of personally intrigued with are the privacy mm-hmm. pieces, which I think it sounds like Adam has done as well. Yes. Um, and, and that's something I sort of felt was unique to Mighty Bell, but um, good for Adam. A- another piece here was the ability to hold conversations, which is, I mean, if you actually take this back kind of to live binders, mm-hmm. Right, I mean, there's sort of the there's the there's the aggregation, and then there's the conversation. Can, do you have a sense from Adam of sort of how those conversations get held? Are they held at all online, or is it just a um, a curation piece? This feels like it's just a curation piece. Um, I would say that that is definitely one of the things that um, distinguishes this from from Mighty Bell, um, insofar as that I, that I think that this is really much more of a, a visual. Um, sort of a, a visual bookmarking and resource sharing tool than it is a conversation around those resources. This is intriguing to me because uh, I'm, I, you know, I've got mixed feelings. Like I look at Glogster mm-hmm. and I think, okay, so sometimes simple really carries the day, right? Um, not, a, not an enormous amount of depth, but just something that, a Wordle. Right? Right. <laughs> Again, you know, sometimes these sort of really simple tools have an ability to get traction, but don't kind of go as deeply as we would want them to. And I'm, st- and I'm looking at this from the standpoint of, you know, can these replace the textbook? And for me, one of the intriguing aspects of it is that uh, if it can do even more than a textbook can do, then I think we, st- we have this moment in time where there's this potential to kind of uh, blow away the ca- capabilities of mm-hmm. a textbook and, and do them online. And and again, I'm you know I'm, I have to be very careful here because I don't want to sound like I'm pitching anybody's product. But I think the conversation piece to me is really critical to that. In no. the same way that the book reader programs have the same issue for me. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right, and I do think that um, I think that that's I think that this is one of the pieces that you know that Pinterest also you know Pinterest, despite all of the buzz about about it, doesn't I don't think does particularly well either. So it is, it's, it's always interesting to me to note um, where social manifests itself and where social is absent. And sometimes I wonder if we just expect, if we just expect the social conversations to still only happen on certain sites or if, um, and how we, how we do a good job. I mean, I think we're doing a pretty good job of finding ways to gather various resources into one place. I don't think we do such a great job um, gathering all of our comments and social interactions into one place. I mean, and I don't, I don't mean all, I don't mean all roads end in, end in Facebook. Um, I don't mean like that. I mean, but finding sort of the, the snippets of conversations and the comments that you've left on blogs and the tweets that you've made about us, a, a topic um, and interactions you have with other people and aggregating all of those across the web into one place the same way that we have figured out now that what we want is that aggregation of, of content. You, we, you and I have both walked the exhibit floor at ISTE. We know that the small group that gathers at the Bloggers Cafe or Social Ed Con is a drop in a bucket yes. in an ocean. Right? And so... The, you know the kind of momentum behind something like um, uh, Glogster or Wordle, mm-hmm. you know, probably in sheer numbers, you know, kind of blow away the more thoughtful tools. I mean, we've watched Digo for years, right? Right, and it's taken years for Digo to actually become kind of now. And well, in part, it took it took Delicious's fall, <laughs> yes, for yes. Digo to become the de facto social bookmarking site, right. And, and in large part, I think because Digo was had such depth to it. Yes. In fact, that's that's funny you should say that because that was one of the things that when Delicious, um, when Delicious, I guess it didn't close entirely, but when it when it looked like the demise, the end was near, that I opted not to use Digo because I felt like there were so many bells and whistles and it seemed like a very bloated tool for me. Um, when the things that I liked about Delicious were its simplicity. Back to this question of simplicity. Um, the simplicity and the simplicity with which it, with which it did social as well. Um, yes, interesting. I, I I love Maggie. I love Digo, but I'm, I would make the same comment. the The social piece and the conversation piece in Digo actually 
was too much for me. Yeah. So what do you use now for bookmarking? Um, well, I use um, b- both Delicious and Digo, and I have, I have them trade links back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I use Delicious for the RSS feeds for the for this podcast and for other interview recordings. Um, and then, quite candidly, I don't use social bookmarking that much anymore. I, Evernote has replaced a fair amount of my social. I mean, social bookmarking number one has personal immediate benefit. Yes, right? it's a way of aggregating your things. And then, as a secondary benefit, it does the social sharing of those links. The personal benefit of Evernote and my ability to search full page text and have the full resource available to me has outweighed the benefits of the social. Right. Yeah. I may not be alone either. I, I use Pinboard, um, which is sort of antisocial in a lot of ways. Um, it doesn't really stress the, the social piece of it, but it's just a really dead simple dead simple bookmarking tool for me that I can hook up as well to Twitter again and send uh, link, easily send links uh, from Twitter to it. So, but yeah, for me, the social, the social piece has sort of disappeared from social bookmarking. I, I want to drill down on this just a bit because one of the things Evernote did for me was it let me put my emails into it mm-hmm. and it let me put a web page, a full web page and recordings and photographs. Yes. And so it was the kind of richer capacity to uh, hold a variety of kinds of items uh, that I, I mean, that was a funny question you asked, but I, you know, I realized I just don't do social bookmarking except for my RSS feeds for the podcast. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in your final story, before we get to the news of the week, um, 168,382,655 168,382,612 lessons <laughs> Delivered. And you're saying, I wonder if there's a connection between 200 billion served at McDonald's, <laughs> scale, and lack of nutrition. Well, I know. I, I need to stop picking on Khan Academy, I think. Don't you? It's mean. Uh, until Saul returns one of my emails, I feel it's fair <laughs> to keep picking on him. But no, I mean, I think that uh, this is something that, I mean, and, and I, you know, I, 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 I do, you know, call attention to Khan Academy here, but they are certainly not the only um, Silicon Valley techno- education technology um, initiative that speaks about content delivery and thinks of what they do in terms of delivering content online. Um, and and I, think that, I think that we need to be uh, more than a little critical of, of using, um, using that phrase and the, I think the, the results uh, are a certain way of thinking about certain way of thinking about teaching and learning that to me are pretty problematic and and ignore um, o- ignore a lot of the other the other things that are important in terms of education. Um, really, this isn't you know. And I I used I used um, a slide that that you shared with me. This is it's this notion of just filling students' brains with with content and content delivery. When we talk about content delivery scaling through technology, it really just to me seems to suggest a more efficient way of filling more students' brains with more information. And I think that that's, I think that that's a, it's a, it's a dangerous, it's a, it's a dangerous sort of thing to embrace as it ignores um, so many other elements of what it means to, to learn. So we actually had this conversation in San Francisco, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Because I had recently been told by my doctor to go on a vegan diet Mm -hmm. for some of my autoimmune disorders. And we were talking about sort of the variety of foods in San Francisco and small restaurants versus what you would get at a chain. Yep. And the whole idea of the value of small. Yes. And the care and the interest in the nutrition and the taste of the food versus sort of the scope and scaling. And I think there's something really interesting here. And maybe when you and I speak at Sloan, we should put up some of those slides. I think that's a great idea. You know, to kind of start the conversation going to thinking about, the, you know, these two visions of education. I, you and I have talked a lot about agency mm-hmm. and the learner's agent. And that's led me to reading uh, in, in about a dozen different books by a man named William Glasser, who was a psychiatrist who, um, psychologist, 
who then wrote several books about school and parenting, schooling and parenting, all around uh, what he called choice theory. And it's really interesting to kind of drill down on this because ultimately his contention is that institutions work as well as the relationships amongst the people in them. And that the primary thing you're doing with a student is building a relationship. And it feels like we're so far from that in all of these discussions. Well, I mean, and I think that, you know, this is, I really feel that way around a lot of the, you know, a lot of this, the, the difference between the, the MOOCs of the connectivist sort, which were really absolutely all about um, connections between, between people, and these new Stanford model MOOCs that are really about content delivery. And thinking just about, in terms of the way, if you, if you focus on content delivery, it absolutely dictates instructional design. And um, so all of these, the Udacity classes and the um, edX and the Coursera classes, you all, you have to go somewhere else to get the social. I mean, they have forums, that's where the social happens, but it's not, it's a separate, it's sort of, you know, it's a separate tab on your, in the, in the software. It's a separate place altogether. Social is actually not part of the important stuff, the way that, you know, the way that these, that the software is designed. The, the important stuff is the content delivery. The important stuff is the lecture. The important stuff is the, the multiple choice exams. And so, social um, community connections with other people, connections with the professor, connections with your fellow students, they're an af- they're, they are an afterthought. You can tell by the way in which the, the, the applications are designed. So can I submit that this may be another case of um, emphasizing what you're capable of doing or doing well mm-hmm. in an era in which power is shifting? Yeah. Right, so uh, the the MOOC as a non-constructivist, non-connection, non-relationship um, in, uh, activity is something Stanford or some of these courses could do really quickly and do really well. Right. But the connection and relationship piece is much harder. So I don't think it's, again, malicious, but you're going to focus on that which you can do well. Right. And you're going to tell a story to match that. Well, and I think that that's what, I mean, and this is what Silicon Valley does well. I mean, and this is why I think partially why Silicon Valley is so excited about education right now. And they're so convinced that what they're doing is disruptive and innovative because they, if they think about education as content delivery and they note, they notice the history of the way in which, um, you know, digital content has been disrupted by um, the music industry, the movie industry, the publishing industry, all of these content industries, newspapers, the news, have all been challenged by technology. It seems sort of, it's not surprising that everyone is terribly excited about the potential for, for um, education um, education to be disrupted as well. And, and this, that's not to say that, you know, technology does do these things, does do certain things really well. Technology does make the, it possible to um, to deliver to deliver content, um, I'm not saying that it that it doesn't. But I, what I am saying is that it's a mistake to somehow think that that's that's sufficient and that that's really what what we what we have in these offline settings, where in, in sort of offline education settings, isn't content delivery. I think we're I think we're touching on something really important here. And, and we're going to get to it when we talk about Penn State mm-hmm. and the cheating scandals. And, and that is the lens through which uh, things are seen and the degrees to which uh, people will protect uh, their own the, – the version of the narrative that keeps them in a prominent place. Yeah. Now, and that goes from innocent to, to, to highly negligent and even malicious. Right. But – um, but I think there's something of value here that's worth considering because you, I think you said it really clearly, which is Silicon Valley has an interest in this right now because it matches things that they believe they do well. Mm-hmm. And so the story's being told in a way that's not really actually the same story you or I would tell. Right. I mean, and I think that that's what makes, again, coming back to Khan Academy, that's what makes this touting of the 100 million lessons served to be a win 
in when you when you think of things in terms of delivery, right? Deli you know, delivering videos, delivering you know data packets across the internet. That's a win. But I think if you think about if you think about a lesson, not in terms of lesson delivery, but in terms of, um, of, of an experience, of a learning experience and a relationship between um, a, a teacher and a learner, that's a very, I mean, that, you can't, it doesn't, lesson delivery doesn't match that model. You can't really tout, you can't really tout lessons delivered um, right. in the same Lives way. changed. Right, right. Okay, so l let's move into this uh, Penn State story because th this rang such huge bells for me. Yeah. Uh, in part because it's a it's an incredible view into how money and power end up um, really driving decisions by institutions. And it was it's kind of a scary story to me. This, to me, this is a this is a this is a very scary story, uh, and I and I think that. You know, I I think a lot, and I hope that we continue to talk a lot, um, you and I, and just in general about what is the purpose of education. I mean, it's something that, and what is the purpose of college? And I think that the that the answer football um, is for many people very much a part of what it means to participate um, to to go to school to participate in uh, the university culture, and. Uh, I think we need to think about uh, we need to think about whatever the answer is to the purpose of education. Um, how can we make sure that 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 that, um, that this is really about a mission to what you said, sort of change lives, improve lives, open minds, um, and not not protect the 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 finances and the legacy of powerful people on campus. Um, it's, it is incredibly, it's just, uh, uh, the reading through the, the free report was, um, disgusting that it's, that at every level of power that, that Penn State turned its back on these young boys. I don't want to make inappropriate comparisons, but I want to tell you what I thought of first, and you can give me a candid response. I mean, I immediately thought of the financial crisis mm -hmm. and the enormous amounts of money involved and the ways in which stories have been told that have protected those who had personal gain that was really not in line with any of what we, what we believe as a country about, about opportunity, financial opportunity. And then the enormous amount of money that's being involved right now, both from foundations in Silicon Valley in education. And, and you know, I'm not trying to draw an inappropriate parallel, but in situations where money and power are at play, it feels like there's a very important conversation to have about what that does to people's perceptions of reality. Well, and, and I think it's important to ask about when, can, when you know something is wrong, when you know that something is wrong, terribly wrong, morally wrong, intellectually wrong, what, how do you speak up when the system around you um, not just won't listen, but that there are um, multiple layers of sort of social, professional um, exilement for those who dare, um, who dare speak up? I mean, I think that one of, for me, one of the passages that was frightening were, or, that was really awful were there were a couple of janitors who witnessed... Um, uh, Sandusky raping right. a boy, and they were afraid to say. I mean, they were. They I were, heard the one quote. Yeah, I, they, they have so much power. I I could lose my job. Right, and I think that um, I and I think that you know I think that that's something that in general. I mean, I think that it is difficult. It is difficult to 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 speak up and speak out. Um, but in in cases where you know we're talking, we are we aren't talking sort of debatable think question, question debatable rights and wrongs so, I mean we are talking about um, raping children and so this is this the fact that people chose to be silent and were afraid to speak up um, in the face of something that is was clearly evil um, I think is is really really sad really frightening so that sits at one extreme 
and I and 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 again, I'm I, uh, you're going to have to help me put this into perspective. But it seems as though that would help us to understand that even when you're not at that extreme, you still have enormous amounts of social pressure and influence that come with these kinds of large scale interests that would make it really important to, to look very candidly at where money is coming from yeah. and who benefits from certain things. And especially as we're talking about, you know, publishing companies or those who have the ability to lobby the testing industry. Mm-hmm. You know, that that it, it would be a mistake to believe that that those environments are wholly without um, the kinds of pressures that ultimately in this terrible case led to people being quiet. Yeah. Am I going too far on that? Well, I mean, I, th- I, th- I think that we, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to make too much of it either. And it, it is, it is interesting to me to think about all of the, how it feels in some ways that there were, it's funny how we have these separate conversations about the university, all of this attention that's been paid lately to the higher education bubble and the student loan um, debt crisis and questions about the purpose, you know, what are students learning anything in college? So students go to college um, that, and, and thinking about who's having those conversations in the media. And then it's fascinating that a conversation around Penn State is somehow a sep- is not, that, that we don't want to have that conversation in light of some of these other things as well. And I mean, I, I just think we have to spend some time thinking about, again, power um, and, the, and the purpose of education and what, what we're expecting these institutions to do with children, <laughs> whether they're, you know, whether they're young boys or whether they're young men, um, young men and women in college. I think that this is, that we have a lot of responsibility here and I'm not sure that we can. I'm not sure that we can easily extract the Penn State um, uh, thing and say, "Oh, this was just this was just Jerry Sandusky, and this was just the climate um, under Joe Paterno." Um, I think that I think that this is something that um, that that happens in various ways a- across the country, and I think we need to be a lot more diligent. Good. I'm going to stop there because I know I've, <laughs> no. I've walked out way too far. Um, okay, so um, uh, <laughs> Michael Chasen yeah. describes <laughs> all of Blackboard's products within the context of his child peeing. I don't, yeah, you know, I, I sometimes I get tips from <laughs> from um, from co- from companies and about their competitors, things that their competitors have done. And you sometimes you want to take it with a grain of salt. And and I will say that when Instructure said, hey, did you see the the keynote that Michael Chasen gave at Blackbird World? And my thought was, well, no. And I, whatever. I And then I looked and I thought, this has to be a joke. Like the guys at Instructure must be uh, kidding. And I, but that really... Michael Chasen did describe Blackboard's features in terms of peeing, and I thought, wow. I, but he's known for that. I guess. And he is. I mean, and, and it, basically, Blackboard World is a big party. And, and again, you know, I did work for Blackboard when they acquired Illuminate. I became a Blackboard employee, and I went to one Blackboard World. And he sees it as a big party. And it's, a, you know, it's, an, it's sort of a, it's a big inside joke. Uh, and Josh Coates keynote at, at StructureCon didn't involve peeing, but it had the same <laughs> level of irreverence. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I thought it was funny. I didn't think it meant, you know, anything <laughs> beyond being funny, but it is, it is crazy weird that he would use that as the context for describing all of their products. Crazy weird. And, and you could hear the kind of nervous, but then guttural laughter from Fine. people around as they as it kept going further and further. Okay, so back to more serious. Yes. Uh, McGraw Hill details plans to split into two. You know, again, here's here's a huge amount of money, right? Yes. This is I mean, this is a this is a very interesting um and I would say, you know, News Corp is also in this process of splitting bet- splitting up um, a large company that has m- interests in multiple areas, splitting off the publishing um, division into something else. In the case of Mar- McGraw Hill, splitting off its education from its um, financial services. And yeah, we're talking about huge huge amounts of money, a lot of debt um, uh, as well. 
Interesting. Okay. Um, Jim Groom has his YouTube account shut. Is that <laughs> the end word there? Did, has nobody looked at this and reopened it? Or nope. what's going on? Um, and this is, I think, a good reminder again about, you know, about controlling your data. You know, Jim Groom does make a lot of mashups, and I would argue that mashups are not copyright infringement, but the, pro the way in which it works is sort of a three strikes and you're out. And if you have three complaints against your YouTube account for copyright infringement, um, uh, they shutter your account. Now, I don't know if they'll send Jim to copyright school um, and make him, make him watch a bunch of videos and give it, to, give it back to him. But I think, it, you know, I think, um, and I'm not sure how interested he is in, in, in doing so. But again, I think we should think about who owns our data. Um, and even when we upload it to pl places, places that say, oh, you still do retain control of your data, again, things, you know, things are, are, um, uh, things are sometimes out of our control. So there, there's a lot of confusion just in the general public mind about copyright, mm -hmm. right? And especially in the case of Remix. Yes. So when something's being used for a purpose other than it was originally intended, right? So a movie poster being used as art rather than to advertise a movie, what's that called? Because typically that's been allowed, right? Um, it, it, it has been allowed. And I think that a lot of these, you know, I think that the, the, in the case of uh, Google and YouTube in particular, I just think that the that the some of this is just the DMC the DMCA takedowns are um, the, it's sort of take down first and ask questions later, and I think that it's I'm not even sure it's a matter of copyright infringement as much as someone says that this is copyright infringement, and Google just act acts upon it. So I'm not even sure that this is sort of a matter of legal debate. This is really, I think, you, Google and YouTube sort of covering, you know, covering their butts to make sure that people who are uploading um, in, you know, uh, videos that are infringing um, are, are taken care of. And again, uh, trademark, copyright, um, the, you know, trademarks exist for the purpose of protecting the consumer, mm -hmm. but they're often portrayed in uh, by those companies that have an interest in um, maintaining control using trademarks as being the opposite. Yep. And so, um, and you have copyright extensions and you know, a lot of money being expended by uh, companies that, that have a financial interest in extending the copyright, which really is sort of exactly the opposite of what's supposed to happen. Yeah. So it's interesting how this, these conversations exist at a public level with, with uh, and I will admit my own sort of lack of knowledge but have this deeper legal issues that often just don't we just don't get to because they're the the perception is managed in the public view by those who would benefit from from a certain perspective on it right yeah this has gotten way too serious i think <laughs> <laughs> okay though we got to finish with something oh university now acquires patent university i keep telling everybody i know about university now how's that story going and is this a positive um, this is this is interesting. I, I don't know too much about this other than than this was that they've um, that they have acquired a, an accredited university in in California. I think it is it is um, interesting to see a number of um, moves on the part of university now. And one of one of the the, the pieces that um, the news items from this week that I thought was really interesting um, and along those lines of this new new um, kinds of Silicon Valley um, education institutions is the departure of my friend um, Ari from Grocket, um, yes. who's joining the Minerva Project, which is a for-profit um, for elite university that was founded earlier this year. Um, so clearly lots of interest in Silicon Valley and, again, um, t you know, taking on education. But uh, And with regard to that departure from Grocket, is that in any way a clue as to a kind of a lost focus there? I I don't know. I mean, I I think that the that the move from the test the test prep focus and Grocket's initial entry was in test prep. They've always described themselves as a social learning company, um, and then the move to create Learnist. Um, I. I don't know if it's a, a loss of focus on the part of, of Grocket, but it is certainly the loss of someone who I think is incredibly smart, incredibly talented, and it's a big win for the Minerva project. I mean, I, 
I will admit that I had sort of, I wrote about the Minerva project when it launched, and I really haven't thought about it since. But with, um, with Ari on board, it'll be really interesting to watch what they do next. He's a sharp data scientist, and he's, um, I think that that's a big win for, for, for them and a loss for Grokit. Loved the reporting on Enable Talk. Gloves that translate sign language into spoken words. Yeah, very cool stuff. The, I, mean, I, I attended the Imagine Cup Finals last year, Microsoft's um, college competition, um, and it's it's a really incredible event. This, the, the tech projects are all um, sort of for social good. They have to deal with um, addressing questions of um, disease and uh, disability, poverty, um, and the the winning team was from the Ukraine that made these very cool gloves that translate sign language into tech into text which is or into spoken words which is a challenge not just because of the actual ge the gestural component but when you think about the way in which um there is no i mean sign language is um isn't universal so there's american sign language for um but but that's but even how you sign in Britain is different than American sign language. And so this is a, it, it's an interesting challenge in terms of translation, um, in, 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 in addition to just translating the gestures. How long has Imagine Cup been going on? Do you have any idea? This was their 10th year. Have any of the previous winners gone on to produce a product that we would know about? Uh, I don't know. If I, not to my knowledge. I think that... Uh, this, this is going to sound mean, but I think one of the one of the difficulties about about the Imagine K to, uh, the Imagine Cup is that they have to use all on, all and only Microsoft products, and I think that that does tie your hands in a lot of ways um, about what you can build. I saw some great I saw some great mobile games, for example, last year, but they were only available on the Windows Phone. So interesting. Okay, uh, Google's got their power searching MOOC underway. Uh, yes, I took. I'm. A, I sat through the the first uh, the first set of videos. Um, interesting to see. Um, I think, uh, actually, sort of brilliant in some ways for for Google to to take on this question of helping people learn to search better. Is Dan Russell doing them himself? He is. Yes. How fun! And then Make Magazine running a maker camp that starts in two days. Yes, then that'll be fun. It's all on Google Hangouts. A project, a project a day via Google Hangouts um, to learn to build. You'll learn to build thirty different projects over the course of the next thirty days. Yes, virtual. Virtual. Camp. Yeah, virtual camp. How fun. Okay, Audrey, <laughs> if you get any complaints about Steve's rant <laughs> on Penn State, the, the financial crisis and, and power in schools, let me know and I'll be quiet next time. Appreciate a great week of stories. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.